Let's get into the Utah Jazz because they went to New Orleans last night, Jake, and comfortably beat the Pelicans, 115-104. But it seems like there is momentum swelling around the NBA that the Jazz are just not a very good defensive team. Is that narrative correct? Yeah, I think that narrative is correct. I think that, that you know, I mean, it may be a little harsh to say they're a, a bad defensive team. They're not a bad defensive team, but by championship standards, they're not good enough. And I think that, you know, the signing of Rudy Gay, when that happened, everybody felt like he was going to be able to come in and really allow them to, you know, play small ball and give them, you know, flexibility with the lineup that they could roll out there. But I think defensively, that hasn't really panned out. You know, against the Warriors, Andrew Wiggins had his way uh, in the pick-and-roll game uh, with Rudy Gay when he was out there against him. And and so I think you're totally right. It's getting around the league that the Jazz can be had um, in matchups and in different ways strategically within the game. And, and so now you're starting to see that we aren't the only ones saying that, hey, you know, they got to make a move. They got to do something to bolster their wing defense to help Rudy Gobert at the rim. And, and, and this is something that obviously, you know, we talk about it every single day, but it, it's, it, it is really where this team is at. You know, last night they're playing the Pelicans and, and they handled the Pelicans, you know, it wasn't really, you know, obviously it was kind of a tight game through, I think what the first, like, you know, two and a half, like maybe through the third quarter, but Donovan kind of turned it up at the end of the game and, and they took control. So it was a comfortable win, but but you just see what even teams like the Pelicans are doing in certain situations, certain sets to get their opportunities against the Jazz. And it's clear as day as to why the good teams are doing what they're doing and getting the, the high percentage looks that they're getting. So, you know, I just think with the Jazz right now, they are this team that that is like one, maybe two guys away from really being a true championship contender. Like when, when you really look at it, what do they need to really be amongst the best in the league? And that's that wing defender that can really help Rudy Gobert. So that's, and it's getting around the league now. And and so that's really where the team is at. And I think that that, if they, if they can make a move, that's really going to help them. I'm curious where most people think the Jazz are defensively, because yeah. I think there is a belief, um, especially in Jazz fandom, that this is an elite defensive team, and I'm telling you, it's not. Um, they are. It, it, I know statistically, um, you know, people love to break down where the Jazz are, and Rudy is the defensive player of the year. And I just go back to what happened the other night against Golden State. They ran high pick and roll. Rudy was pulled away from the basket. Rudy Gay, Donovan Mitchell, Jordan Clarkson, Boyan Bogdanovich, Royce O'Neal, none of them had an answer in the high pick and roll against Golden State defensively. And I just don't know that there's a way to fix this team. In fact, I'm pretty convinced there is no way to fix this team as it is currently constructed. So I guess this goes back to the conversation we've had many times on this show. Is Danny Ainge a guy you can count on? To make a deal. Well, yeah, I think that's the light at the end of the tunnel if you're a Jazz fan. So Danny Ainge comes in as a guy who's got all this history with the Celtics, a guy who has a proven track record of making deals to uh, improve teams, making deals that are actually logical, smart deals that, that can take you to where you want to go. And I think the problem, and not really the problem, but just the side effect of of that for this team is that you're going to see some names go that maybe you weren't expecting. And I don't know who that guy is. I mean, it, it could be literally anybody. It depends on the deal. But you're going to, like, Danny Ainge is going to have to move a mainstay on this team to make this happen. And, and you know, when you when you think about names like, you know, the, the names floating around the league for the Jazz are Lou Dort from Oklahoma City or Jeremy Grant. You know, I've even heard of uh, Brunson from Dallas as a guy that maybe the Jazz could swing somehow, like, like there are there are names floating around for the Jazz that could potentially help them, but what you need to understand as a Jazz fan is that they, they like there will be a major name that pays the price for making this team better. And and I don't know if that's Jingles, I don't know if that's Bogey or or who it might be, but you just have to understand that you they didn't bring Danny Ainge in for no reason. You didn't bring Danny Ainge in to just chill at the deadline and do nothing. So as a Jazz fan. I, if I were you, I would be expecting some some movement um, and a major name to go. Yeah, but I, I also think 
that when you look at the way this team is constructed, Don, you know, Donovan and Rudy Gobert are in the first year of their mega deals. If you're going to win a championship with those two players, I will maintain what I've said for a long time. Rudy Gobert can't be one of the focal points of this team if you're going to win a championship. And I think that means you have to bring other guys in who can support him. Now, Hassan Whiteside, yes, I think that's been a nice upgrade. I think you see it allows them to run. But one of the things that I wonder is, has Rudy Gay been what you hoped he would be? And I don't know the answer to that question yet. Mm -hmm. Because defensively, he is no better than, than, than the guys around him. And, you know, as pedestrian as, as this team is defensively on most nights, he does not help them become a better defensive team, Rudy Gay. Yeah, and, and, and it's I, I'm not going to sit here and say it's not surprising, but, like, I, we, he, when he got brought in, it's not like we expected him to have, you know, this amazing first step at, you know, at his age and, like, you know, to be this awesome defender. But it would have been nice if if he could have kept, you know, the, the, the casual 3-4 in front of him. I mean, that's kind yeah. of what, what the conversation was. I mean, obviously, Rudy Gay can shoot the ball. Obviously, he's shown uh, a nice jump shot. But but defensively, again, uh, like, again, with the Warriors, you know, the Warriors intentionally switched Andrew Wiggins onto Rudy Gay to exploit that matchup. And, and so the best way to say it is Rudy Gay is not good enough defensively to run with the ones. He can run with your twos, the backup unit, but he cannot run with the ones consistently if you want to win a lot of games. And so needless to say, with the Rudy Gay situation, you know, it's much like these other guys that the Jazz have brought in, like the Eric Pascals, you know, the Hassan Whitesides. These guys are good enough to run with the twos, but they're not good enough to consistently run with the ones and have you winning ball games at the rate you want to. And that seems to be where this team is at. And, and it's really tough because you're, it's almost like the worst place to be you know, in, in sports, right? Like you're this really good team who dominates the regular season, but then when you play the best teams in the league and they know how to exploit your weaknesses, you have no answer for that and you end up losing the games that you want to win. So guys like Rudy Gay are great for the second unit, but when it comes down to it, when you're five minutes left in the fourth quarter and you need an answer, Rudy Gay is not the guy you're going to, you know? Like, that's not – he's not going to be on the floor, and that's the tough part about it. Yeah, and I, I think he's a good pickup. There's no doubt about that. I mean, what he brings to you in limited minutes I think absolutely has value in small ball. I totally understand that. You know, obviously his ability to shoot the three is significant, but – I think the thing that really stands out to me most is this team's issue is not offense, it's defense. And Rudy Gay does not help you defensively. And we can sit here and we can shine a turd, but this team needs significant roster change if they're going to win an NBA championship. And I, I don't know that Danny Ainge, whether he's a guy that you can count on to make trades, I think he certainly is. I don't know that just one trade deadline is going to allow you to overhaul and change and influx the talent that you need to consistently compete for a championship in this league in just one trade cycle. Uh -huh. So my feeling is Danny Ainge right now is not going to be able to make trades to change that. Does a Jeremy Grant help you? Probably not in the long term. If I'm the Utah Jazz, I'm not looking to go out and pick up a massive long-term contract right now. I'm more looking to change incrementally now and significantly over the summer. Mm -hmm. That's where my mind would be because I don't think you're a championship team if you go and get Jeremy Grant. I don't. He hasn't been able to stay healthy. He's hurt now. Um, you know, a lot of people, like you mentioned, have talked about Lou Dort. Yeah. Lou Dort's not a guy you can count on. This, What this Utah Jazz team needs is a true number two option for Donovan Mitchell, and they need that guy to be a two-way player. They need that guy to be, you know, the, the, somebody that can shut down a pick and roll, somebody that understands defense and can switch off the pick and roll. Because at some point, you're going to have to address the elephant in the room is, which Rudy Gobert on his own is not good enough to protect the rim. Yeah, well, I don't think anybody in the NBA is good. Any big in the NBA on their own is is not 
good enough because of the level of talent in the NBA. So, you yeah. know, you, you, I mean, you can take any, any of the best, you know, elite bigs in, in, in the league and they're not going to be good enough to run uh, again against the Warriors to run all the way up to guard the pick and roll against Steph at the hash mark, you know, beyond the three point line and then get all the way back. I mean, that's just not, that's not humanly possible. And, and that's the thing, like, like the the Jazz, because they have this weakness on the perimeter deep on the perimeter defensively, it just puts them in these precarious situations, and it makes them easy. It, it makes it easy for teams to exploit them. So yeah, I mean, I think you know it as really much does. as as much as Lou Dort wouldn't be uh, like a he's not that guy that you're you know describing that like almost basically like a, a guy that could be almost an all star every year level player is basically what we would love to see the Jazz get which is not going to happen at the trade deadline. It could happen over the summer. If it was going to happen, that's when it would happen. But I think what Lou Dort could bring is sort of that sort of that dog mentality to this team, like that, that gritty guy who is a defensive-minded player who can really get after somebody on the other team, and he's a perimeter right, guy. He's right. not that interior player. So – so that's why I think a lot of people look at Lou Dort as a as a as a potential like sort of band aid option for the Jazz for this season right now. But but I agree with you. He's definitely not somebody who'd be like the long term. Hey, this fixed what you know this roster really needs. Yeah, and I, I I just hope that the Jazz have a a win in the long term mentality. Mm -hmm. Win three in five years. That's what my view. If I'm the Jazz, would be. Because you have a generational superstar in Donovan Mitchell. Mm -hmm. You need to embrace that. And you need to do everything that you can do to facilitate Donovan Mitchell's growth and success. Mm -hmm. Yet support Rudy Gobert with players around him so that Rudy Gobert becomes a championship caliber player. Because right now, Rudy Gobert is your best defensive player and your biggest problem. Because you rely way too much on Rudy Gobert. It's amazing through no to, fault of his own. Yeah, I mean, it, and and again, I I think we have a reputation on the show for you know ripping Rudy Gobert. That's certainly not what I mean to be doing. What I'm telling you is he's an elite defensive player on his own, but that's not good enough to win in the NBA mm -hmm. because teams are 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 too sophisticated offensively, and you have next level teams like the Golden State Warriors who simply the other night ran a, a, a excessively high pick and roll. They basically set the, the pick two feet out in front of the three-point line, and the Jazz never adjusted or had an answer to it. And by the way, I think the other thing that needs to be talked about and the question that has to start being asked is Quinn Snyder the guy to lead this team to a championship? And when you're playing eight, nine guys a night, the answer is no. Yeah. And Trent Forrest, I agree, did not play well last night. But I don't understand the unwillingness or the the inability to figure out how to get minutes out of your bench, guys. Yeah. Like, Eric Paschal's been an absolute zero for this team. Yeah. And I, I don't understand. Yeah, that. And, I, and I think, you know, the this whole idea of, hey, like, this guy or that guy, you know, didn't play well on any given night, that's going to happen. I mean, you know, you see that in your starting lineup on a nightly basis. There's always a guy who's going to have an off night. But but I think the thing is, like we always talk about with the bench, you know, you need your your Trent Forrest, your your Jared Butlers, you know, you need your Eric Pascals to 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 be as sharp as they can coming off the bench. I mean, you know, you're never a bench player is never going to be as sharp as a starter would be with how many minutes starters get. But you would you can't have them just sitting away, you know, getting rusted, basically. You know, you can't have them sitting away you know, on the bench, just not playing. And and that's that's the frustrating part. What was the point of this great draft pick in, in Jared Butler if he's not going to play and you're not going to develop him? I, I think we've seen in the league time and time again, that's why the good teams are really good because those young guys that they draft, you know, that they drafted like three years ago that you haven't heard much about, but who have been getting minutes come in when – the mainstay gets hurt and ends up winning you the championship. You know, how many times have we seen an injury here or there in the NBA finals in game six, and you needed that one contribution, that one play from that one bench guy. That's what these guys are for this team. And they're not being developed. And that's, that's why that's frustrating. So is that a reason to say that Quinn shouldn't be the guy? Yeah. I think that's a conversation piece. The problem is, is that Quinn Snyder has been the guy that's led this team to the playoffs 
on a consistent basis now. Well, <clears throat> but there's a big difference between getting to the playoffs and winning. I mean, yeah. I don't think there's any doubt that if if you look at the top teams in the NBA right now, and whether that be the Bulls, the Nets, Suns, Warriors, as we've talked about, I can't see the the Utah Jazz winning more than one or two games in a series against those teams. Mm-hmm. I think it's very difficult when you're built the way the Jazz are built now. I think it's very difficult, A, to change that, and B, to compete athletically against those teams because they're just so wing dominant. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're looking at the Chicago Bulls right now playing without a center. Um, You essentially look at the Golden State Warriors. They're getting Klay Thompson back on Sunday, I guess it is, and they they basically rotate bigs, and Draymond Green plays the 3-4-5 for them. I mean, I don't know how you answer that. And if you look at the Suns, who I think are the closest team to the Jazz or who the Jazz can most compete with, I don't know how you defend the Suns because the Jazz have really struggled to defend the mid-range as well off a of pick and roll. So what do the Suns do? They play mid-range off a of pick and roll. Yeah. And and I, I don't know, so I don't know how you stop that. I And I don't think Jeremy Grant fixes that problem. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be very interesting to see what Danny Ainge does in a nutshell. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's great watching this team. They're a good, not a great team, the Jazz. Um, they're going to go and beat teams like New Orleans. But their schedule has really afforded them a very strong start to the season. Mm-hmm. And it'll be interesting to see what they do on this upcoming road trip because the schedule gets much more difficult. Yeah, and, they, and I think the last thing I would say in this is the moves that they make at the deadline. Um, as a Jazz fan, what you should take away from that is their philosophy on how they, they're going to go about building this into a championship team. Because, again, Correct. I want to emphasize you don't bring Danny Ainge in just as a, you know, just another hire or just like just, you know, hey, we just wanted this guy on our staff. Danny Ainge is a guy you bring in to build a championship caliber roster and and do what you were talking about when, you know, like three and five years and, and have that kind of run. So I'm. So that's if you're a Jazz fan, this this trade deadline is definitely one of the most meaningful, not just for this season, though, like for what the long term picture is going to be. <sighs> yeah, we got out of our system. All you right. feel better now. I mean, yeah, I feel I feel better now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see what uh, the commenters have to say. Uh, Justin Salas, good morning to you. First one in. Justin says, good morning, fellas. Jazz are for sure not a great defensive team. You take Rudy out in the paint. Uh, out of the paint, and we're probably bottom of the league defensively. Well, I think you saw that last night. Well, and that's the other problem, too. I think that's a great point. So that's that's the other thing that's happening. As soon as Gobert comes out of the game, then the whole the, the other team shifts the way they're playing. So even when you bring Hassan in, the other team, whoever they're playing, is going to change the way they're playing the game. And again, that's, that is the, the problem. So even when Gobert is off the floor, you still have the same issue. Your perimeter defense is is just a sieve. They're, they're yeah. just able to get to the bucket. Greg Hawkins says, sup, fellas. What's up, Greg? Uh, good to see you again. Good to see you too, Greg. Uh, Mitchell Harding says, hey, fellas, hope you're doing well. Good to see you, Mitchell. Taylor Hopkins, or Tyler Hopkins, excuse me, I would love to have Jeremy Grant on the Jazz. I've heard he's a great shooter. He is. Yeah, he's a really athletic guy for his size. I mean, he. I mean, when you talk about athleticism, Jeremy Grant really embodies that. But the problem is, like you were saying, he he suffers injuries a lot, and, and and I think that the injury bug on this team, thankfully, stayed away this season. But but you know you don't want to sign you know, you don't want to sign a guy for that much money and not have him play. That's the trouble. So and I don't want to speak out of turn. I'm looking up his uh, stats as we speak. Yeah, I mean when he's on the um, floor, he's an he's elite a great three player. point yeah. shooter. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I want to say that he is a like in his career. Oh no, I lied. In his career, Jeremy Grant is a 34% three-point shooter. But at that position, that's pretty good. I mean, he's, you know. I would agree with that. I mean, he is, you know, I mean, when you're 6'8", 200 pounds, I mean, if you can shoot a three, that's pretty good. Um, But, I mean, he is a guy who's shown that he's capable of putting up 20 points a game. The problem is he does that in 50 games a a season. Mm -hmm. So you can't really count on him especially the last three years, yeah, you can't count on him to play um, a lot of games. So that's the one thing that, that worries me about him. <coughs> Excuse me. And by the way, I think the other thing that 
you have to keep in mind is he's been a, a an Eastern Conference player mm-hmm. uh, for pretty much all of his career except that stretch in Denver. Yeah. So that's just kind of something to keep in the back of your mind stylistically. How does that play? Um, let's see. Uh, Eric Devera, good morning. He says, Gobert is great defensively, but he can't do it alone. Whiteside's an upgrade from Favors. Gay is an upgrade from Niang. Is, is Rudy Gay... Is Rudy Gay what you thought he would be? And I know I keep asking that question. I mean, I, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't expect Rudy Gay to be like twenty to twenty five a night or anything. I mean, I expected Rudy Gay to be like ten to fifteen a night off the bench, and hopefully, those are those are three point shots that he's knocking down that help you build momentum from the bench. I mean, that's really what I was hoping for. I I, I thought he'd be better defensively. Yeah, and I don't know if it's systematic. I just thought he'd be better defensively. I get I, that. I think what I it mean, is is the league, dude. The the teams that the teams that the Jazz are playing, even the worst teams in the NBA, know how to get the matchups they at least want. Like the difference between sure. really good teams and really bad teams is the good teams make their shots. Like I know that sounds super simplistic and like very basic, but that's literally the difference. I mean, if you watch these games consistently, you will see the bad teams and the good teams are basically running the same sets. They're running pick and roll. They're running the same style of play. The difference is, is the quality of look they're getting. So again, for, for, for Rudy Gay, like I feel like these teams understand that he's a little bit older. They understand that he doesn't have a quick first step. So they understand, like, they're going to put Andrew Wiggins on him, and Andrew Wiggins is going to get to the bucket. Like, and that's the thing. I think the best teams in the NBA yeah, know how to manipulate defenses. Yeah. And I think when I look at Golden State, when I look at, you know, Denver does it pretty consistently when they're healthy, um, even though they have just been a suck pot lately. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's really how guys like Luka Doncic make their living. Yeah. They know how to manipulate the defense into the matchup that helps them the most. Exactly. The Jazz don't have an answer for those switches. Yeah. So until they do, you know. But I I think now is the time where you have to start wondering, is Quinn Snyder the head coach of this team when they finally do win a championship? Uh, It's a great question. You know, I I don't don't know. You know, and again. I don't know either. I think that that bringing in, again, the Danny Ainge hiring, to me that was just a signal of, hey, nothing is beyond Danny Ainge. So, like, he'll do whatever it takes to to win. And, and that includes... But his reputation is huge trades yeah. with big names. Yeah, huge trades, big names, rocking the boat type trades. And 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 I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I think that, that you know, if, if you said to me, hey, we're going to have to move, you know, we're going to have to move Bogey and, we're, like, we're going to move Bogey Royce and Jordan Clarkson for this, you know, for Paul George or some insane deal, let's say. I wouldn't have an issue with that, you know? That that to me helps the team and that mentality um I think was missing from this organization before Ainge got here and and I think it will help them a lot, but but I do think that that the that Quinn is definitely in the conversation as something that could be changed, no doubt. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah. And I, it'll be interesting to see cuz Jazz fans typically don't call for a guy to be fired. Right. Um you know, I mean, we were we got crushed on the Dennis Lindsay stuff for saying he should be fired. He's the, he's the biggest problem. Roster construction's the problem. And then when he gets fired, Jazz fans rejoice. Right. Well, and I do think that Quinn Quinn did take some heat after that Clippers the Clippers series loss. There were a lot of people who were like, "Hey, why didn't he make adjustments?" But as dumb as that was. You can write that off though you because can. of the roster construction. You can. Yes. Now, I think they've made small changes. You spent luxury tax money, and you are not better. In fact, you are. I think. I think last year's Jazz team was far superior to this year's Jazz team. You are. I mean, you, you're not getting 20 point a night, Boyan Bogdanovich right now. You're getting 16, 18 a point mm. a night, Boyan Bogdanovich. And I think I'm probably the only one who cares. But I think Boyan Bogdanovich has to give you 20 points a night. Mm-hmm. He has to. Yeah. It's vital. It's really important. Because what you're seeing is, it's great that Donovan Mitchell is breaking guys off against New Orleans, Mm -hmm. but when the Jazz play great teams, Donovan has to be elite. That's that's a given. If they're going to beat teams like Golden State, Donovan Mitchell has to play at the top of his game. Mm -hmm. But he also needs Boyan Bogdanovich, because Boyan is the second best scorer on this team, right? 
And you can get away with beating New Orleans when Rudy Gobert gives you, what did he give you last night, 10 and 17 or something. Yeah. That's going to work against New Orleans, right? Because fat ass still has a broken foot. He's not even <laughs> playing for them. Excuse me, I mean Zion Williamson. Right, yeah. It's just the way it pronou- you pronounce it. That's, you know, fat ass is Latin for Zion Williamson. Right. Anyway, here right, or there, the yeah. point is, uh-huh. fat. it's yeah. fine to play that way against New Orleans. But it's not fine. You know, like, I, I'm, I, I'm curious to see how do the Jazz handle this upcoming road trip at Denver, at Toronto, at Indiana, at Detroit. You come home for Cleveland, at Denver, at the Lakers, home for Houston. Like those Houston games. I don't know how many people have noticed Houston's starting to figure it out, and Jalen Green's healthy now, right? So there's not an easy night in the, in the NBA. Yeah. But if you're an elite team, those are all games you should win. Those are all games you should win. If you're one of the top teams in the NBA, you should win those games. Yeah. And the Jazz have had a very favorable schedule. And then they occasionally run into the Golden State Warriors buzzsaw, mm-hmm. and they wind up losing. But the thing that's very telling um, about that Golden State Warriors game is they had three guys in 20, oh, 20 point or more. Well, right? that's really the benchmark. That's what it takes to really to separate yourself, is yeah. that, the, that three 20 point contribution. Well, and they played 10 guys off the bench. So you're playing 10 guys. The Jazz are playing seven or eight. What are some of those names? Just a random, like, some of those low-end guys. Uh, Kaminga, Iguodala, Toscano Anderson, Poole. You notice how those names you guys probably recognize. They're they're fringe guys. For your average NBA fan, you know, yep. Toscano is a fringe guy. Jordan Poole has made a little bit of a name for himself. But if you're a casual observer, you may or may not know Jordan Poole. But the point is, is like how many minutes did Steph have in that game? Did he even have thirty minutes in that game? Thirty six minutes. Okay, so he played. They played for him Wiggins, a lot. Thirty. You know, like yeah. I mean, but if you look at the Jazz bench in that game, yeah, it's Joe Ingles, twenty six minutes, one of seven from the floor, zero of six from three, two points. Oh, zero of six from three. Rudy Gay, twenty minutes, zero of two from three, seven points. Jordan Clarkson, twenty four minutes. 20 points. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. Those are the only guys that came off the bench. All of them played 20 minutes. So I brought this up to say, okay, here's the best team in the NBA right now, the Golden State Warriors. Mm. Your answer to that is to play an eight-man rotation, and every single player who played against the Warriors played 20-plus minutes. Yeah. That's not a formula to win. I mean, that to me, when you shoot, first of all, when this team shoots 31% from three, they're going to lose. Yeah. But why did they shoot 31% from three? Because the Warriors are arguably one of the most difficult teams to play against because their defense is very young and active. Yeah. So it's difficult to shoot, get quality looks against them. Yeah. But I also look at, I also look at it at a guy like Rudy Gobert, 20 and 19 against Golden State, and you lost. Right? So what do we always say? The Jazz shoot poorly. Rudy Gobert has a huge game. And you lose because the only way that Rudy puts up huge numbers, it's usually a bad shooting night for the jazz. Yeah. So that's why I say like, you just have to, you just got to start building now. Yeah. Because I, I, I almost feel like this is a season where you should expect the jazz not to win. And then next year and the year after that, and the year after that, I would certainly think in 2023, this should be a ch- NBA championship team. By 2025, this team should have won a championship. That's what I would say. Or, oh, at, least, or at least been to the certainly. NBA final. Maybe they lose in the finals or whatever. But, certainly. But they should have been to the NBA finals. Yeah. Certainly. Um, you know, I, I – yeah. Anyway. Uh, James Knight, good morning to you. He says, I believe the overall depth of your roster could be critical if COVID or health <coughs> – health protocols, excuse me, plays a part in the playoffs – um, and there's every chance it will. Yeah, I yeah, agree. And that's a great point. And by the way, yeah. the Jazz have avoided the COVID bug. The COVID bug, the injury bug. They, I mean, they've done a great job. All credit to them. And I, th- it's been critical. But, James, I think you also have to see that Joe Ingles has to give more. Yeah. Well, you just got to make a shot. I mean, you can't be 0 of 6 and expect the team to win. I agree with that. I mean, that's just what it is. Eric DeVere says, many NBA 2K simulation YouTubers tried the – Unrealistic trade overhauls needed two years before the Jazz win a championship with Don and Gobert. Now, in reality, we would be even harder. I think this roster needs a significant overhaul. And I think, you know, right now, Rudy Gobert 
And I will just say the same thing I always say. Rudy Gobert's not a championship caliber player. He's just not. And when I look at this roster, Donovan Mitchell's the generational talent. And if you are going to win a championship, my firm belief is Rudy Gobert will not be part of that roster when you win a championship. Now, he can be, but you're going to have to significantly alter 10 guys on this roster to make that possible. Uh Because if Rudy Gobert is one of your foundational pieces on the cap and on the floor, you better have six other guys who play heavy minutes and are good defensively. Because as long as you have Rudy Gay, and I I hesitate to say it because everybody says, oh, Royce O'Neal, oh, buckets. <laughs> as long as Royce O'Neal is, is your best defensive player outside of Rudy Gobert, you're fucked. Like, you're not going to win anything. <laughs> Excuse my French. Like, you're not going to win anything. Yeah. You've got to change a significant part of this roster yeah. to win a championship. Here, no, there. Uh, Ramiro says, morning, guys. Missed you. Good to see you guys back. Appreciate you being here, Ramiro. Yeah. Justin Salas says, I've been down in, uh, down on Quinn for a couple of years. Honestly, against Golden State was the first time I've seen him adjust rotations. On a side note, I definitely called Zion being a bust. Yeah. He is too big for the way he plays. He will keep getting hurt or he has to lose weight, which takes away his advantage. Fat. And he's not been able to lose weight. In nope. fact, he has gained weight. Yeah. Uh, Jack T says, okay, name a team that had six foot six one backcourt and reached the finals in the 21st century. Donovan has to be a point guard to contend. Well, and this is a pretty significant conversation that's going on around Donovan Mitchell right now. Is he a guy, is Donovan Mitchell, and we're 34 minutes in on the jazz on this, but is what it is. Is Donovan Mitchell a guy that you can say, here's the ball, go win me a championship? Mm. Mm, mm, mm. I don't know. Now, if you say to him, I need one bucket, sure, he can get you a bucket. Yeah, but I don't in, think I don't think he can do what the LeBron and KDs and Stephs do. I don't think he can carry your team in that way. I is think, he but he, he, and here's my question. Yeah. And this is why the mid range is such a big yeah. question with Don. Yeah. Cause I don't need LeBron. Yeah. I don't need KD Steph. I need Chris Paul and Devin Booker, let's say. Yeah. How did they get to the NBA Finals last year? They were just automatic from mid-range. Mm-hmm. Like, where is Donovan Mitchell automatic? He's automatic going to the paint, but I think we know the wear and tear that takes. His three-point shot has gotten significantly better. Yeah. But I don't know that he has a go-to jumper against elite teams. It Again, it's great he's breaking guys off in New Orleans last night. Mm-hmm. Hey, that's awesome. I love seeing it in January. That's great. Yeah. What is Donovan Mitchell in May and June? And I don't know the answer to that question right now. Yeah, well, and I, and I think, you know, the the term that you've rolled out for the longest time since we've been talking jazz on this show is, like, it turns into Donovan and everybody else. And I think that's kind of the other reason the Jazz need to bring somebody else in who's a threat yeah. because I think in the postseason, you know, teams just key on Donovan and and take him away. And and I don't know, I'm not prepared to penalize him for that. I think that that's not his fault that that teams are like, well, if we take Donovan away, we really don't have to worry about but, any of these other guys. But this is what I always say about Devin Booker, yeah. right? That Devin Booker can get his shot anywhere he wants it. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I think there are very, when when you compare Donovan Mitchell to Devin Booker, there are very few things that separate them. Yes. Size is certainly one. What is, what is Don? Six one? I think he's six one. Yeah. Devin Booker, six five. Yeah. When you look at their games, Book this year is shooting at an elite level three point wise. I mean, he is finally a 40% three point shooter. Yeah. But his mid range game is can't miss. Like, if he gets inside the arc at the top, it's over. Yeah. It's over. And I think that's the one thing. I don't necessarily know that size is a problem for Donovan Mitchell. Well, He I plays think it, much larger than 6'1". But it changes It changes his ability to get shots. Like, the same the, – the ease with which Devin Booker gets his shots in the mid-range 
is different than, you know, Don's ability to get those same shots in the mid range because of the size discrepancy. And I also think that, that, you know, Donovan, as he ages through his career, that explosive stuff going to the rim is going to leave him. And when you're, when that leaves you at some point in, in his career, it will leave him. He's going to have to become a more dynamic mid range player. He's, he has not yet like to me, he he hasn't figured out yet how to dominate a game through the mid range, how to control the pace of the game, how to really dictate the the to the other when team. When the other team is on a run, and you're Chris Paul, or you're Devin Booker, or you are Steph Curry, you can just get your shot anywhere you want it. Yeah. I, I and I think that's something that Donovan Mitchell doesn't have right now. Mm-hmm. And I, I look at, again, I'll just go to book one because he's one of my favorite players and I watch a ton of Suns. I look at Devin Booker and he is sh- he's shooting 40, almost 2% this year. And he is scoring one point less because his surrounding cast is far superior yeah. to what it's ever been. Yeah, And it's far superior to what the Jazz have. And this, again, you know, it it, it is... I don't know if I'd rather have DeAndre Ayton over Rudy Gobert. I would probably not. But when you have a big that can score with the range and depth that a guy like DeAndre Ayton can, it just gives you so many more options. Yeah. When you have a point guard in Chris Paul who can dish or shoot, it gives you so many more options. When you have guys like Mikhail Bridges that can just stand in the corner or can come in and dunk on you, even though he got blocked the other night, Yeah. Um, it gives you so many more options. Jay Crowder... I mean, we could go on and on about why the Suns are a tough team to deal with. That's what the Jazz are not. They're not a tough team to deal with. The Jazz beat you when they shoot threes. At it, when they shoot 40% or more, it's over. It's over. Give me 53 point attempts, make 40% of them, and it's over. Yeah. You know what? I, I, I just think that it's one of these things where you don't even have to, you don't even have to wonder. Mm-hmm. If the if the Utah Jazz are going to make threes, they just are. Yeah, that's who they are. Yeah. So all of that to say, the Jazz are just not ready to win a championship right now. Not yet. Soon. That, that to me is that is what it is. Um, Connor says he's shooting forty two percent because he doesn't shoot many three. Okay. Now, Connor, I'm just going to guess you don't watch a whole lot of Suns games. So Devin Booker's three point numbers. He is shooting six and a half threes a game, a career, almost a career high. You have to go back to 2018 where he shot seven threes a game. And in 2017, he shot 38%. He's shooting six and a half threes a game and he's making 42% of them. Okay, so to say he's not, his percentage is higher because he's shooting fewer threes is completely wrong. That's just not the case. Um, and by the way, he is he is he is in my opinion just a more well-rounded player which you would think he would be because he works all summer long. Mm-hmm. All the guy does is play basketball. And I'm not saying Donovan doesn't cuz Donovan does the same thing. Um but Connor's other point and now his comment got filtered. I don't know why it got filtered. Uh cuz we don't do that. YouTube does. But your other point was that that Donovan is just a more well-rounded physical player. Sure, does Devin Booker miss games? Yes, he does. But he hasn't in the last two years. This year he had that hamstring. I think he missed six or seven games. But Devin Booker has turned into one of the best offensive players of his generation. Mm-hmm. I mean, he is he is one of the top guys outside of, you know, whatever it is LeBron's drinking for breakfast. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. But if you look at the best offensive players, the, you know, the Trey Youngs, the Steph Curry's, the Kevin Durant's. Devin Booker's a cup below those guys. I mean, he's right there. Yeah. So I, I if if you're trying to find a way to knock Devin Booker, I think you're going to have a very long day. Yeah. Because the, his in his defense, by the way, which was always the big mark against Devin, I think Devin Booker's defense has improved markedly. Yeah. So he he's a he's a very good player, in my opinion. Um Eric Devera says Royce is streaky on defense as JC is on offense. He has to go and bench, needs to play more minutes for at least this year 
since they're not winning this year. It could be. I think they can win this year. If you go get, but it's going to take a Bradley Beal, not a Jeremy Grant. Yeah. It's going to take. You have to be prepared to make a to to make a substantial move. You do. You do. And the problem is I don't know that you have the pieces to make that move. So, and you need, Joe's going to have to be one of the guys in that deal because he's got an expiring contract. Yep. I mean, you would, you know, I, I, I don't know. We'll see what happens.